guys two things uh firstly i wanted to thank you for all of the love uh, and the support for the fader souza show in our new season where we're talking about failure you've just been amazing and i have really loved every moment of recording every conversation we have so much more in the pipeline i can't wait for you to see it second thing today's conversation is really special because this is a very special person uh, her name is dr kiran kwelo she's one of india's senior most gynecologist who's been practicing for over 45 years so apart from all of the other conversations on failure we've talked about PCOD we've talked about IVF about egg freezing and how to do that well and safely we've talked about little girls getting their periods early we've talked about protecting ourselves also from UTIs that we get from public bathrooms so all of that conversation is in this show you can actually find it using the chapter breakup to find the questions that you want answers to but i really hope that you will watch the whole thing through Dr Kiran Coelho I have wanted to do this interview now for 7 years since I first met you because every time we meet you have such amazing stories to tell about your career and um I believe that we can learn so much from these stories so for our audience who doesn't know Dr Coelho is one of the most respected gynecologists and a uh, high risk pregnancy specialist in the country 5000 keyhole surgeries is that correct yeah. maybe more you know <laughs> and a career spanning 45 years as a gynecologist I, i'm much older than what i look and, <laughs> you look uh, amazing though and say thank you so much it's always a pleasure <laughs> so this is a conversation where we talk about the tough points of our career so you realize that in order to get where you are today there are bumps along the way and the bumps are normal and dealing with those bumps is what makes a career um but if i were to ask you really as india's foremost gynecologist and surgeon right now uh closing in on 70 years of age working 18 hours a day it used to be 18 after covid after covid it's now 16 that's 16 that's a separate we, we will get to you know uh, what that's <laughs> like but what according to you if you look back at your career what was that moment of failure that you know it makes you take pause and think i would have done that differently well i don't know because i always loved to be a gynecologist i had that empathy for women so it was really you know working these long hours has always been a pleasure it's never been a, a, a chore to me and i feel like you know sometimes when i am on holiday then i you know i don't enjoy the holiday because i just love the work so getting up in the morning and meeting women and taking care of them and doing the surgery that itself is such a joy feel that you know really holidays are not really holidays i am an armchair traveler so <laughs> i like that you know so i always go when i go internationally for a lot of conferences i always uh, you know have conference and holiday so it's never really holiday it's always both but i think you know as you said that your this talk is all about failure so i look at failure on two aspects one is difficulties and failures along the way of my career over the years and failure as a mother i think we'll take the mother first because i always feel even till today that you know maybe i should not have done so much and been so ambitious and had a little time because our children are there for a very short time you know i remember that when i was in practice and i mean for so many years i hardly ever looked after my children i used to see them on the weekends and that was really difficult you know i had my daughter when i when during residency and residency in bombay is residency you are being resident in the hospital you don't come home so my daughter was literally uh, taken care of by my husband and he used to bring her to see me to rajawadi or, or, or kama hospital wherever i was on the weekends and one day i saw as a 3 year old girl that she had corns on her feet and i said how did you get corns on your feet she says you know papa takes me everywhere but i can't ask him to carry me his arms will get tired so i walk and then of course my husband got a good scolding but then i realized you know i i, I didn't take care of my daughter and then when i had my son i was a lecturer so at least hours were better 
but even so when he was you know his first communion when he was seven etc all the parties etc that we had and even his first communion i was in busy practice where i was working 18 hours a day and i literally had to ask my patient push 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 let i had to go for my son and he was waiting for me because i came after all the guests but he had to give a little talk and he was so happy that his mother was there so all our lives have been like that you know i opened my wedding gifts after 20 years because <laughs> i got married and then i started residency and then i never really opened my gifts and when i did open my final house i opened my gifts and i saw all these silver tea sets had turned black and i sat and i said what has happened to my life you know but then of course the work always compensated for it compensated for it and then you know when my daughter was in besant montessori i still remember uh, i was called and i was so happy i thought maybe she's done something good but miss demi wadia she was the principal and she fired me she said dr koiro either you have a career or you be a mother you can't be both look at what your daughter had done and what my daughter had done she was 3 years old and at show and tell you know i was a at that time a lecturer at kama hospital and there was no one i had to take the call and there was no one at home so i took my daughter and there was an c section emergency c section and she refused to stay in the waiting room so i put her in, in the corner with a cap and mask and made her sit there and i in the ot in the ot in and a c section in a c section i mean it was in middle of the night 2 o'clock and then where to leave her so i did that and then she saw the c section to go home and then uh, that was it my husband was with those days with pepsi so he was in delhi so she has told the uh, the teacher and all the children in the school i know how babies are born my mother cuts the tummy the baby and the blood reaches the ceiling and the the medicine from the bottle goes into another bag in the bureau and but would it have been possible doc for you to be to have the to have had the career you've had and also be around more not really because we don't have group practice over here it's all an individual practice our practice in india is quite different from abroad abroad everyone has group practice the person whom you see for 9 months is not the one who's going to deliver you whereas here it's different you you take care of your patient you have a solo practice your the patient has total faith in you even now my patients whom i've delivered 30 years ago will still ask me you know which pediatrician to go to which cardiologist that sort of rapport for which i love and i would hate to travel to work anywhere else uh, especially not in this us where every doctor is a potential you know patient is a potential sewer so you are going to be very cut and dry with them I, i that's not the way why i took medicine that empathy for w- women was so important i remember even in the middle of the night fail i would dress up wear lipstick wear perfume and then go and deliver the woman because she should not feel that look at this uh, woman has come out of i have disturbed her from her sleep she's come out angry in her you know this thing so i, I and you know the patient even though she would be in pain she would say thank you dr koyro for dressing up for me i <laughs> had chances to give me so much joy because that sort of staying with your patients sitting with them and delivering them that doesn't happen in today's practice and you know interestingly now we are used to having women gynecologists in fact it's what everyone prefers but that was not always the case this used to be a man's bastion right absolutely, absolutely a man's bastion because women would not you know they they wouldn't be able to leave their family and their children not everyone had an understanding husband like mine and i feel very often that my practice took off really because i really had that support from your spouse and over the years obstetricians especially now of course we have obstetrics and gynecology obstetrician you can choose not to do the deliveries and do only gynecology but then in when you have an individual practice it's the obstetrics where you do or the deliveries which bring in the gynec patients later you understand so it has to be together so now the current generation as you said they like to have it all because they will choose only obstetrics or they'll do only ivf or they'll do only perinatology or only and end- grand gynec endocrinology so they'll master in those subjects so they'll have a limited practice they have a good practice also uh, they have job satisfaction at the same time they look after their children so that's possible now it was not possible in my time i'm talking about now 45 years ago and all over the years that you build up your practice to the extent that you have there was a time i think when i was delivering everyone in banda khar center bus my consulting used to go on till 1 o'clock in the morning i used to sometimes not come home at all 
and then next day I would have three or four major hysterectomies. I had four or five minor laparoscopic surgeries. I would have two, three deliveries. And then again, I would go into consulting and again go at one o'clock. So sometimes only Sunday I would come home. And then, you know, maybe have a look at what the children did. So if it wasn't for a husband and I used to keep three good mates, it's not possible. Mm. So that we can do in India. What, what for you would be a bad or a difficult day at work? Bad or difficult day, I wouldn't ever say. The more work, the merrier. But, uh, you know, sometimes I do a lot of high-risk obstetrics. So when you have an elderly um, woman, like say, for example, yesterday, it was a very sad day for me. It was Sunday, but it was one of the very senior trustees of the hospital there, some known to me, who had had about five or six IVF failures. And then she was finally pregnant with twin pregnancy and everything was okay at seven weeks. And then when she went for her 11th week scan, both the fetuses had died inside at nine weeks. There's nothing you can do about it. There must be some genetic effect. But the tragedy that that woman went through and I sat with her and I had to do the evacuation under, under ultrasound guidance. And the, you know that her tragedy really, I felt. So those are bad days. Sometimes one another day I had a, you know, very sad, very few cases, but I had a patient who had diabetic pregnancy. That's a high risk pregnancy. And normally if you have a patient with diabetes, at 37 weeks plus we deliver them because we know that after 37 weeks the placenta is not supported by the, um, um, the placenta doesn't support the pregnancy. And so you have, so I had this patient who was 37 weeks plus and uh, she I admitted her and she said, you know, doctor, I will. I would like because, you know, you have this Mahura cesarean section. So the patients chose that go to the Pandit. Yeah, yeah. So Pandit you know, the time yeah, day. Yeah. And so she said, you know, my Pandit, she said, not today. Can you do it tomorrow at so and so and so? Uh, so I said, all right, everything looked okay. But in the night, the baby's heartbeat disappeared. And next day, I had to do a C-section for a dead baby. Those, those are the... Try moments so in your you life. So yeah. you have cases where people put off a delivery because the mahurat is not correct? Oh my gosh, all the time. You know, there's a mahurat for leaving the room. There's a mahurat for the incision. There's a mahurat for the baby coming out. And sometimes, you know, if I have three mahurats at the same time in three different hospitals, I have to tell the patient, please change your panditdi. Because <laughs> I can't be in three or three different Isn't hospitals. that risky for the baby though? Well, it is, but to be, of course, to be due risk, of course, if it has to be risky, you know, then I tell them if, if it's an emergency C-section, if it's an elective C-section, we can plan the date. Okay. But I get my patients five o'clock in the morning and one o'clock in the morning and this disrupts everyone's life. But you know, when it comes to Mahurath over the years, Faye, I always agree to them because if something goes wrong, they'll say it's something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how it would really, really help because... If it's a natural delivery, then okay, you can understand the stars and all that. But if you're going to plan everything, then what's the point? But anyway, it's each one's view. And uh, if it makes them feel better, then why not? So you basically had a career where you've been on call day and night, weekend and weekday for 45 years. Absolutely. Just imagine. I've not seen a theater, a movie in a theater for, I don't know, since my college days. Because if I'm there and if I'm on call, then I can't see a movie. So I, you know, thank thank goodness now for iPads and, you know, we <laughs> actually watch at home. But it was so funny because I used to deliver all these actresses and actors' wives. And Fee, I would not recognize them, number one, because I don't watch Hindi movies. Oh. And I would not have seen their movies. Hmm. I still remember Rithik Roshan's second baby I delivered. And he says, you haven't seen any of my movies. I said, no, no disrespect to you, but I don't watch movies. No, no, you have to watch my Joda Akbar. He said, you know, that was for the second baby. I said, no, you know, I don't go to theatres. But he arranged in Ketnaf's theatre, a special screening for Joda Akbar. Now, I'm not going to go there alone. So I put up a notice in uh, Holy Family and Dilawati. Any resident doctor wants to watch Joda Akbar, please come and pick up here. <laughs> and there was me and my husband and all the resident doctors. And we watched this wonderful movie, which was really nice with Rithik and Suzanne giving us uh, snacks from candies next door. <laughs> and it was such a lovely experience. But as I said, 
no time for this thing but I, you know now and then i do enjoy you, you you're also uh, officially run officially the gynecologist to the stars Oh, uh, all almost what second generation Bollywood you are delivering now? Absolutely. Is that by choice? The girls whom I have delivered now are all coming to me. Mm-hmm. No, you know it just happened that way. Faith uh, that I was practicing in Bandra, I was in Holy Family. I was a professor at uh, T N Medical College, mid a long, long, long haul, as I tell you shortly. So it's just that I was there, and uh, you know by word of mouth, I think it was Rekha who kept telling everyone, "You please, you have to come to my gynecology." So oh, by word of mouth, everyone came to me. be it um, you know meera kapoor and her babies and uh, all of hema malini's grandchildren and you can name i mean on and on and on so they just came and they had so much of faith and i think they were you know the best patients because they listened to every word that you had they had so much respect and they still do and for me every patient is a celebrity i do a lot of charitable work at holy family hospital even today i go in the middle of the night to a general ward patient in holy family where i get nothing but i still do that so your your, your uh, holy family work is pro bono it's pro you don't get paid i don't get right. uh, my uh, outpatient i don't get paid and by choice everyone's the watchman's wives and uh, you know all the poor people who actually should have keyhole surgery but if they go to municipal hospital say you know they have to it's so bad so why not you know so tuesdays i devote entirely to pro bono till today people don't know i was a lecturer then i was a reader assistant professor in tn medical college and then i started private practice now when i started private practice all my colleagues said how are you going to practice because i don't do abortions i don't do family planning and i don't give cuts i don't know if you know fee but cut practice is what happens in in, in what's a cut practice? practice cut practice is the general practitioner who refers the case to the consultant will get you know anything from 20 to 60% of the surgeon's fee goes to the gp who refers so i don't do that cut practice i never did i have a direct practice but i was fortunate to be attached to holy family and then holy spirit hospitals where i got a direct practice in fact within 6 months i was so busy without doing abortions without doing any of the family planning but i was so busy with all the genuine cases they just walked into the hospital that ultimately i had to give up holy uh, holy spirit because holy spirit was on deri chakala and i used to take my rounds at 12 o'clock in the morning i still remember holy spirit sometimes i was up and down the road from bandra to andheri to andheri chakala all this for so many years and i had a dashan dog and i used to go alone and i drive alone because i had no driver those days I had a dachshund who looks like a doberman sitting in front of me and Zack and he when the bell rang he would come with his collar and when I said holy family he'd go back to sleep because holy family was around the corner but when I said holy spirit he was so happy he would come and I'd see he'd sit in the front seat I'd and play with the watchman when I'd finish my dinner then come back and when it so it was you know really really hard why do you not do abortions I don't do abortions from conviction number 1 Uh, I'm Catholic so it's definitely um, you know a, a crime in my religion but even otherwise I'm so busy with infertility practice trying to give couples a baby that I you know I cannot do an abortion so I don't do abortions I don't insert uh, this thing I I do tubal ligations yes mm. because that is not taking life a life but I believe right from the time the egg meets the sperm there is a life and i will it's not mine to take away so that one part of my career i have just not done in fact i may have lost millions of patients but i don't get this thing because i will not i may send them to someone else because it's their choice but i don't do abortions by a rule and i've you know be, had a very successful practice without doing abortions women uh we have more and more women now having babies later in life absolutely and uh a lot of times people ask what is the latest one can wait before you know when it, when it's we're still in the safe zone and when you can still deliver a normal safe pregnancy i know you know fear unfortunately this this has not changed that the women have a very short biological life span that is you know the ideal age for childbearing is 18 to 26 <laughs> when you have your babies between 18 and 26 you are eternally youthful you see now mothers and all that they all look young because they've had their babies young but who gets married before 26 28 and then after that you have emis you don't want to 
have your babies until you're 35, 36, 40. But after the biologically, the number of eggs that we have, the ovarian reserve starts depleting. After the age, I would say, of 35 to 36, 38, you ovulate once in two months or three months, and that too, the eggs are not that uh, good. So some of them are, you know, already aging. And after the age of 40, then it's always assisted reproductive technology. So for these girls, assisted reproductive technology has come in a big way. I do three egg freezings per week. Do you know that all the girls now, those who are abroad, they pay them for egg freezing here. Of course, they, they have to pay themselves. But young girls, say, from the age of, say, 25 to 32, they are at their prime. So if we freeze their eggs, those are young eggs which are frozen, it's for like them, for them, it's like an insurance policy. They can wait to select their partners. They can wait till later. Then they can get married, their husbands. Then there's uh, the, the eggs can be fertilized if they don't want to conceive by themselves. There's always a backup plan. So egg freezing is one. That's the latest. Then, of course, IVF. Anyone can have a baby today. Even this weight, do you know, male infertility is so much on the rise that almost 30% of urban males are infertile because of low sperm count. And that is because, again, delayed childbearing, because of stress, because of so many things. And so many couples don't have intercourse. They're too tired at the end of the day. They have only intercourse on weekends. And do you know, there's only 48 hours in the whole month where you can conceive. Mm -hmm. So if the 48 hours don't, cons uh, you know, if they're holiday or weekend, then years pass and they don't have babies. So that is what we are facing now. And everyone is delaying their childbearing. A, a woman is supposed to have a baby every alternate year. That keeps the uterus and lining good, the wall good, but, you know, we have overpopulated the world. Everyone has one or two babies. So delaying childbearing, having fewer children, results in fibroids, adenomyosis, endometriosis, where you bleed externally, and some fertility. So definitely... Um, I my first advice to any young couple who come to me is, you know, forget about everything. We still have help. We still have in-laws. We still have maids in India. Have your babies when you're young. Okay. I'm an example of it. I've had both my babies and then, then my career. So, but of course, there's a lot of compromise. But, you know, you can do it. For those who can't, especially those who are, you know, maybe actresses or maybe, uh, you know, people who are in the, uh, where their looks matter, where they really can't afford to take time off now to have their babies or young girls when their careers who, you know, it's first of all, there's a glass ceiling and we all know it, hmm. in, especially in the corporate world in India today. My own daughter-in-law was in the Gansi. She went back to the States because the corporate India is all male dominated. So you have to work that much harder to reach the top. So then you can't stop and have a baby. Hmm. In fact, they ask you in the interviews, will you, yeah, they asked me when I, when I was a young resident doctor at Wadia Hospital, I had to sign a bond that I won't get pregnant because there was six, uh, you know, we had six months, six months and six months, one and a half year of residency. I signed the bond and I promptly got pregnant with my daughter. <laughs> And I hid my, I was very slim those days. I hid my pregnancy till the seventh month doing that hard labor of working 18, 20 hours a day. And then suddenly everyone said, Are Kiran is pregnant because they took out the seventh month you show. <laughs> so it's like that. Even when they take interviews, they ask, are you, are you married? Are you going to have a baby? Where are you going to stay? You know, all those things. So there's so much discrimination. So you recommend, uh, you, do you recommend egg freezing for 25-year-olds? What's the ideal age? Ideal age is, I would say, 28 to 32. You know, okay. Even if you're 25, 25 is very young because you can have your own babies and you never know. But there are many girls who come. And I think that would be the age, 28 to 32. 30, that, that's a time where you can take, it's only 14 days off of your life because the first 14 days after the period you're given injections, every month only one egg ripens. But when we give these injections, you get multiple eggs in the ovaries. They're very uncomfortable, of course. Mm. And then under anesthesia, under ultrasound guidance from below, we take out the eggs. Then we uh, grade the eggs and freeze them. Mm. And then there is the one-time fee of the uh, egg freezing. And then per year is another fee. Is it prohibitively expensive? It is quite expensive. 
it is around anyway if you see around 2 2.5 lakhs for the actually freezing procedure and then 70000 per year per year to per year to so people do do come and they all want to have the eggs frozen then of course you have ivf it has to be ivf hmm. and then couples who come after the age of 38 40 etc it has to be ivf and it has to be a donor egg because you know, after a certain age, we have a test called anti-mullerian hormone, which checks the girl's ovarian reserve. And if the reserve is less, no matter how many how many hormones you how many hormones you pump the woman, she will not produce that many eggs. And you can't do so many uh, cycles of IVF. So then it's an egg donor, a young donor, husband's sperm in the woman's uterus. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is PCOD. Yeah. Um, was not talked about so much maybe when my mother was younger. It was not existent. It was not, where did it come from and why is it so prevalent? It's so prevalent because of stress. Now, PCOD is all about stress. Just like diabetes, India is the diabetic capital of the world. Again, lifestyle related. Uh, so also, um, uh, PCOD, one out, we have done the studies, one out of every three adolescent girls and one out of every five women in their reproductive age in urban India has PCOS. And what is it is just a hormone imbalance. You see, every month there's a diurnal variation of the hormones, right from menarche up to menopause. Every month, one egg ripens, it ruptures, it regresses, and the periods come out. Now, this is a finely tuned balance between the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, the ovary, and the lining of the uterus. And it all has to be in, in balance. It's called the menstrual clock. Now, anything, any disturbance like exams, you see girls who have exams, they don't get their periods for six months. Athletes who run, they don't get their periods. Or anyone who has any stress, and all girls are stressed. They all have to compete, etc. So because of that, and also sedentary lifestyle. So we don't know which comes first, the egg or the chick. Because you serve first, put on weight. Mm. You know, the, the ovulation occurs because the estrogen in the blood is a certain level. Yes. Now, when we put on weight, the estrogen goes and sits in the fat cells to form estrogen. So the estrogen is never at a high level to cause ovulation. So the, all the eggs start accumulating inside the ovaries and they start producing male hormones. So you get acne, pimples, hair growth, and it also causes insulin resistance. So even though your pancreas is okay, you have insulin is all right, but your body is not recognizing the insulin. So it, it's like knocking on the door and the door doesn't open. <laughs> it's like that. So whatever these girls eat turns to fat. So they say, you know, we are dieting, we are exercising, we are exercising so much, but we are not losing anything. So frustrating because we have to give them insulin sensitizers. So we have to mod. And these girls who don't get, who don't get treated for PCOS for a long period of time, they have a higher risk of having lipid met metabolism, atherosclerosis, cardiac problems, uh, endometrial cancer, all and diabetes. So therefore, lifestyle change is the root. So before anything else, I always tell young girls, we should never give them hormones. I don't, you know, and I always advocate as I'm a teacher, never give hormones to young girls, except if they have too much of acne, then all right. Otherwise, just a lifestyle change, weight loss for every gram that they lose, they they cycle regularly. So weight loss, sleeping six to eight hours, de-stressing in the form of yoga <laughs> or some meditation, little me time is something that we all have to do. And that You're saying this way. after talking about working for 18 hours. Yes, I know. <laughs> but I must tell you, Faye, that now I've lost 12 kilos in six months and it's all in the diet. We are what we eat. So, you know, sensible diet, Maybe, and, and now, you know, I'm steeping more hmm. than hmm. I used hmm. to because I do the high-risk obstetrics, not the, uh, the, the regular obstetrics. Not the and I do a lot of gynec surgery. Is there a lot of requests and uh, questions about Asempic now? Oh, yes. Drugs oh, that so. cause weight loss because the West is taking it um, and using it, uh, you know, regularly. And if you are in a cycle where... Your weight loss is, you know, causing more problems and the solution to the problems is weight loss and you're, you, you can't break that. Absolutely. Is Ozempic or a similar drug? Yes, Ozempic, Monjaro. Yes. All these are wonderful solutions, actually. They are well researched. Okay. And it's for those women who have comorbidities, like if they have 
diabetes or they are not able to lose weight they are going in for you know high uh, cholesterol lipid metabolism mm -hmm. and they are asked to lose weight and they can't lose weight but it's not cured for use in india is it, it of course it is uh, no or munjaro no you can get it uh, from abroad so many people do, uh, and it's 70000 per injection it's quite expensive whereas ozempic is a little bit uh, cheaper they you it's in tablet form also in the form of rebelsis but you know the side effects are tremendous what are the side effects the side effects are nausea um, um and some or constipation then uh, if you don't eat for too long you feel giddy and, you know you can't do your day to day work and a constant feeling of nausea that is what my patients say and long term and long term no because you can't take the, the, the drugs long term the sad part is you lose weight but then you're off it if you don't change your lifestyle while you have lost weight go, the rebound is worse than what it was before there's the other question about the hpv vaccine yes. um which is perhaps the only one in the world that can help you prevent cancer in india cervical cancer is one of the biggest killers of women and also detected very late because indian women tend not to go for regular checkups what is your recommendation on the hpv vaccine should we give it to our teenage daughters at what age yes i recommend it completely in fact i was on the on the and so board for cervical vaccine when it came in uh, on the select on the board and uh, these are the two vaccines we know that now science has shown that 99% of cervical cancers are caused by hpv which is sexually transmitted hmm. now the hpv virus are uh, there are about hundreds of hpv viruses out of which few of them 14 16 and you know a few of them are, have what we call oncogenic potential that is they most women have hpv they clear it but these particular strains of the virus they go and change the dna in the cervical transition zone you know the part of the cervix is, part of it has what we call columnar epithelium mm -hmm. part of it has got the skin like epithelium or the vagina that transition zone in young girls that is very very sensitive so if the dna virus goes there and changes the uh, uh, the the dna then these girls 10 years down the line are more prone to get cervical cancer and that's a fact now why cervical cancer is so prevalent number one in in number one killer of women in urban india is breast cancer oh. in rural india is cervical cancer in rural area why because all the men folk come to the town to earn their living and because they are separated from their wives they all visit prostitutes they get hpv they go home and they give it to their wives the wives get cervical cancer and there is no proper screening pro programs in urban india <clears throat> in uh, rural india as there is in even in urban india we have to beg the women to come for the annual checkup in western countries your insurance is linked to that whereas over here we don't have that so that's why pap smears anyone who is sexually active should have a pap smear every year and a combined pap smear hpv testing every 5 years so there comes in the other there are two uh, cancer and uh, two hpv anti hpv mm. vac vaccinations which are available in india one is cervarix the bivalent and the other one is the quadrivalent or gardasil every adolescent girl should have this definitely because the sexual mores of this generation are quite different from the past generation so there's an argument saying that no 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 my daughter is not going to be promiscuous and so i don't need to give this daughter may not be promiscuous but men are promiscuous you know when i was on the board for cervix we had a survey at that point of time on the sexual uh, mores of young indian males across the board maybe uneducated partially educated blue collar workers white collar workers etc and you know what the response was 70% of indian males are unfaithful to their wives so therefore the men so get the vaccine get the vaccine we are vaccinating young boys also now okay so boys yes, can also boys get the vaccine okay. r and rb now the indian uh, association of pediatricians have a recommendation after the age of 12 to 14 all girls should be vaccinated for hpv and up to what age can up to the age of 45 why because even though it's no point when you're already married etc 
and then getting that because you you may be exposed already but at the same time genital warts vulval warts etc they are cured by you don't get that if you have the vaccine so we give it right up to the age of 45 that doses yeah very the, expensive it's expensive? <laughs> it's expensive but the government is now pushing the government is pushing for two doses yeah for two doses um but the other question that comes up for women a lot and if we read on the internet it gives us a different answer but can uh can we get utis from public toilets not at all not at all not at but all. a lot it's, of people seem to believe that, that they the believe case. that actually the problem with you unfortunately for women one out of every three women will have urinary tract infections urinary tract infections occur in women because the urethral passage is very short hmm. you know for men the urethral passage is very long whereas for women the urethral passage that is the urinary passage from the bladder to the external is very short and you have the vagina which is full of bacteria and you have the rectum which is full of e coli in mm. close proximity mm. so the women by 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 being a woman is more prone to get urinary tract infection so when it when does it happen it starts happening right from the honeymoon we call it honeymoon cystitis mm. intercourse frequent intercourse the clitoris is just above the urine passage and the vagina is just below there's bruising and there all the bacteria from the rectum and the vagina then go up into uh, the bladder that causing cystitis and then if that cystitis is not treated you have to actually do a urine examination do a culture find out what organism is causing the infection and to what antibiotic it is sensitive to mm. and then give the complete treatment only then it is eradicated otherwise it keeps recurring so that's number one is that women are more prone to it washing yourself from front to back is always important never back to front because then the e coli come and in urban india women don't drink enough of water that is the cause because they don't have working girls have no access to clean toilets you know the you don't want to go to a toilet which is dirty so you don't drink water if you don't drink water it's concentrated urine because we have so much of insensible perspiration so then because of that you get urinary tract infection and if you go to a toilet and you sit on the toilet seat and there's a splash then you you may get so uh, tell all the patients put your pee safe uh, layer the pan with uh, with toilet paper and then only half standing squatting pass urine then you won't get but if you use a so that that's actually a myth it's all the other things put together wearing nylon underwear not not wearing cotton breathable underwear that also results in vaginal infections vaginal infections then lead to urinary tract infections sometimes after a delivery it happens sometimes it happens after catheterization because of a surgical procedure and one out of every 3 women after menopause will have urinary tract infection because the lining of the urethral passage becomes very thin out because that is estrogen related so we give these women vaginal estrogen creams so that they don't get so that the lining becomes thicker and they don't get frequent uti so unfortunately urinary tract infection is the bane of a woman it's just a side effect to being a woman it's side effect <laughs> when it's going to be tracked in fiction <laughs> there are a lot of these now and i don't get prostate infection that the men have yes small uh, <laughs> blessings of being a woman there are a lot of uh, now um, intimate wash creams and soaps and things like that that are available do you recommend them yes because you see the vaginal ph should be acidic it should mm. be less than 5 mm. all the soaps that we use are all alkaline and therefore the vaginal ph or is altered by using soap so rather than using a soap for intimate wash don't use um intimate wash you can just use warm water hmm. and if that doesn't serve no soap but there are soap some soaps like re wash or lactosid or they are ph balanced soaps so that they ensure that the ph of the vagina remains acidic they are recommended okay or just warm water or ever but never wash inside the vagina hmm. so all those intimate washes where they spray inside the vagina should never be used because the vagina has its own flora its own flora the flora is the good bacteria that the lactobacillus and the fungus and they live in a very nice commens commensurate matter that's that's called the vaginal flora 
So any of the, if you push in Dettol or you push in any of these flora inside, that alters the flora. Antibiotics, when you take antibiotics for maybe throat infection or any other reason, you always have to take a pre or prosbiotic, a probiotic, because the bacteria of the vagina, the good bacteria, all wiped out by this antibiotic. By an antibiotic. And, and then the fungus takes an upper hand. And then you get yeast infections recurrent. So therefore, the prebiotic or the probiotic ensures that the lactobacillus still remains there. Do we uh, overuse antibiotics in India? Oh, 100%. 100%. For a, in, that's because of general practice. The general practitioners just giving an antibiotic and then they give it only for three days when the course is five days. All hospitals, we have an antibiotic um, re registry. We cannot give antibiotics certain antibiotics, the higher antibiotics, until we actually go through the registry and find out, do a culture, see the antibiotic sensitivity, and only then give antibiotics. So in India, antibiotics are really overused. What is the risk of overusing antibiotics? Oh, that, that the bacteria develop resistance to the antibiotics, mm. because especially when it's given half or not in a proper dosage, then what happens, these bacteria mutate and they develop resistance. And then you know, you have to have higher and higher antibiotics then to treat the same uh, disorder. So that's how you have multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Do you know, to one out of every three Indians have had tuberculosis. Hmm. That is it. Most of us have fought it. But those who have multi-drug resistance where you they take half the treatment of the thing. You know, all, everyone has spitting in India. Everyone spits, spits, spits. All the spit has got tuberculosis bacilli and they're in the soil. So even when you breathe and you go into somewhere, you're breathing these tubercles, your, your natural immunity system deals with it. But there are so many tuberculosis, tuberculosis of the throat, of the neck, of the stomach, of the genital. India, first thing, the diagnosis, if there's a fever, a uh, uh, cough and cold, which doesn't last for more than one month, think tuberculosis. Hmm. Pregnant woman not getting, not conceiving, think genital tuberculosis. It's so common in India, not so in other countries but definitely in India, and that is mainly because of spitting. Indiscriminate spitting. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing along with PCOD that we didn't hear about until recently was perimenopause. Yes. Now there's a lot more talking about perimenopause. Uh, what is perimenopause and why is it a recent entrant into our lives? It's a recent entrance because now women are now in the workforce and in the old days, everyone went. It's a change of life. It's a natural change of life where the estrogen, the ovaries are not producing enough of estrogen. So it's not main menopause. It's no. before main yeah. menopause. So in the, the waning period goes over. So perimenopause is the, is the period of time leading up to menopause, the three to four years, and then the menopause. What is menopause? Menopause is always a retrospective diagnosis that is, the periods have stopped for more than one year. Now you're in menopause. Okay. So all that four to five years leading up to that period is called the perimenopause. Hmm. Now perimenopause, everyone, it, it is because the the estrogens from the ovaries are gradually waning. And we have estrogen receptors from the head to the toes. A woman is a woman because of estrogen. The skin, the, the breasts, the tissues, the bones, the vaginal health. Intercourse, everything is the even the heart health is all uh, related to the estrogen hormone and the estrogen receptors everywhere. What happens? A woman will never get a heart attack as long as she's getting her periods because she's protected by the estrogens. But a woman after menopause has the same risk as a man of getting a heart attack, and that's because of estrogen. So this perimenopause is a waning period of is a smaller period. Leading up to menopause, where there's going to be a change of life, but it's gra fortunately graduate and gradual. And because the estrogen receptors are slowly, 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 there's less and less and less and less estrogen, you have all the symptoms. Now, the symptoms in the past, the mothers were so busy, they had so many children, they never bothered. They didn't even notice. They didn't even notice. Most women, even till today, don't notice. Men, women who are very active and are busy at work, they don't notice. They just, it, menopause comes and menopause goes. But there are many women who do have hormonal changes. Hot flushes, irritability, bloating, weight gain of 5 kilos is there for every menopausal woman. Weight gain, this thing, then uh, irritability, then 
loss of memory you know a girl who would pride herself on knowing everyone and everybody's name suddenly you go to a party and you see her face and then you want to introduce your husband and you forget the name and this is menopause and this is menopause <laughs> this is very menopause i used to remember every patient their children which room she was when she delivered and everything i'd forget which class my son was in but i would remember which room that girl was even many years but now even i'm forgetting a little bit so that sense of loss and then the sense of you know a sense of uh, loss of charge of your life singers i have singers who can't sing i have actors who can't act i have doctors who can't operate because of that fearfulness that in a, a person who was so brave is suddenly felled at her prime of life because of perimenopause so therefore this menopausal change is definitely there and it's more i think in working girls and more people are more aware so often the husbands take them they're so insensitive take them to a psychiatrist she's not sleeping insomnia is another thing not sleeping she's irritable this that and then the psychiatrist will send them to us or they go to the cardiologist and say this this is a problem and then the cardiologist will send them to the gynecologist that these are all menopausal symptoms and how do you recommend dealing with menopause hormone replacement therapy or just it's part of life go through it's it. part of life so you have to accept it there are definitely a vaginal creams which because you know another thing is libido loss of libido is one thing and that is the time of life where the husband is having his last this thing like you know it's difficult for him to have intercourse but he wants intercourse all the time men they say men get 40 not yet 40 i would say at 50 <laughs> and you know i have so it's so sad fair because i have so many women who come at 40 and they want vaginal tightening done because their husbands will then threaten to you know go somewhere else so because and their their wife their vagina has become loose because they've had so many children giving so many children to their husbands hmm. but as i said vaginal tightening is something that we do very often okay you do that yes so many so many women do come so many women come for hymenoplasty now they they've had intercourse still especially in certain communities because the girl has to produce the blood stained uh, garment oh. <laughs> things have changed not not changed so much but they've changed to a certain extent but not so much anyway certain communities so i was coming back to menopause how to deal with it so just dealing with it is understanding that you're going through menopause mm. making certain lifestyle changes giving more me time uh reducing a complete change in your lifestyle in the sense diet nutrition exercise has to be weight bearing exercises are very important because this is the time you have the muscles become weak so if you do weight bearing exercises not only will you tone the muscles but the muscles are attached to the bone so the bones become strong yeah. another thing with menopause is not peri- perimenopause but menopause is that you lose 30% of your skeleton in the first 5 years after menopause that's how a woman from being straight becomes shorter 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 and then finally on a wheelchair and that is because of untreated menopause so we do give calcium vitamin d supplements etc to prevent this because what happens estrogen c- controls absorption of calcium deposition of calcium in the bone and prevention of resorption because the bone is a living structure but when the estrogen becomes less there's less absorption of calcium there's less deposition and there's more resorption so the bones yeah. become brittle it comes like a thief in the night or first there's osteopenia then there's osteoporosis then even a rickshaw travel and your spine gets fractured you fall you get a colis fracture and a fracture hip of the female is number one killer of women after the age of used to be 70 what i'll say you know <laughs> that's where your fat protects you a bit because the, you still have the estrogen in the fat things <laughs> <laughs> just leaner women more have more pro- fractures your process and then then do fatter women some some, some so, advantage of being chubby some advantages <laughs> of being chubby <laughs> no but um did you find that in your career in the last 45 years what is the starting point that young women should start seeing a gynecologist i would say if of course they have pcos they see even before they are sexually active but i think after a girl is sexually active then she should see a gynecologist at least once a year is the are indian gynecologists still old fashioned in the sense that is there a lace of judgment of oh you're not married but you're sexually active a lot of times gynecologists will still say are you married 
instead of asking, are you sexually active? Is that changing in your opinion? That I think should change. Now, I'm an old timer, but I have, uh, you know, very liberal views. But not everyone is like me. So, you know, I, I remember now to see change in when I was first started practice. I would take the girl behind the curtain when the mother sitting there and ask, are you sexually active? Hmm. Now the girl, mother asks me to give contraceptive to the girl because she's sexually active. So, you know, yeah, things have things changed. Are changing. Do you recommend uh, contraception? Because there are a lot of young women now who are concerned that it's messing with my hormones. Uh, I don't want to be on the pill constantly. It's not good for me. What's your stand on uh, oral birth control? No, oral birth control has come a long way. And I, you know, I may be a Catholic. I just don't deal with a child which is already formed. But definitely I offer contraception hmm. in all it form, in forms. Now the pill has again undergone just like the rest of gynecology. There's so much research on the pill that the latest third generation and the fourth generation pills are so natural. They mimic the natural hormones. Hmm. They help women with PCOS. They actually help women not to get endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer. So definitely the new generation oral contraceptive pills are wonderful and everyone should have it. Are condoms foolproof or do you recommend the oral contraceptive as well? For condoms are not oral proof. They, they, we have a, a hundred women years. That's how we test. And condoms are 6% per hundred women year. That means if hundred women used only condoms, as a form of contraception for a period of years, a six, a one year, six of them would get pregnant with the condom. Yeah, so, so that is how we uh, judge the efficacy of a contraceptive device. Now, condoms are good because a woman doesn't have to have anything. We have female condoms also, which are, which are good. So uh, you, they are used only at the time of intercourse. The woman has no side effects. And also, you you are protected from sexually transmitted diseases. Yes. So, to a certain extent, because the condom. Why does the condom fail? It's because there may be penetration before uh, you putting on the condom. Hmm. Yeah, what we call uh, pre-condom, this thing. And, you know, there is some amount of sperm in the present, in even pre-ejaculatory sperm, what we call pre-ejaculatory semen also has certain amount of sperm so that they may be hanging around the glands penis and that would mm. impregnate. So if so, wrong usage of the condom, bursting of the condom and improper use of condom, and poor quality of condoms, that causes condom failure. Mm -hmm. So when we uh, prescribe the condom, we always tell the girl how the, the, how the partner should use it. Mm. But condoms, I, I, I feel, is a very for good form of contraception because they especially young girls who are having intercourse now. You know, after the eye pill came in, everyone is having intercourse. The girls are not worried about getting pregnant. Mm. And you have to tell them it's not only pregnancy, it's, it's STDs. Do you know how much of herpes I see? Which never I, I used to see before. One out of every eight American women have herpes. Now we are finding the same thing in urban India. Because all the girls, and uh, school girls and college girls are all sexually active now. It was unheard of in our time. Mothers have to be so careful of their children. You can't send them for sleepover. You can't send them this thing. You have to escort them. But who? The children don't listen. Their mother, their parents are their worst enemies at that age. <laughs> their friends are their best. <laughs> their, their, the peers are, are all important. So, you know, how where do you draw the line? I think half the stress of women who have young girls and young boys are <laughs> their children. And the morality today. There's no word that's immoral anymore, you know. So that's, you know, that's a changing. So that, therefore, you have to have good protection. What are the side effects of the pill right now in its, in its latest, most advanced form? Yeah, in its most advanced form, the side effects are to a certain extent the, the nausea, the weight gain, and um, are much less. In fact, the, the pills which are given for PCOS... That is the anti-male hormone, uh, the thing with drospinone and the new drugs uh, that have come in for to prevent the androgenic or male effects. That they also are very good to control the weight gain because they are, they've got mineral corticoids. Anyway, I want to be too technical, but they do not cause water retention and weight gain. Hmm. So the water retention, the weight gain and the acne that used to be with the old pills are much better now with the new pills. 
but of course certain amount of nausea and what i feel is really very worrisome and the deep vein thrombosis we have young girls who have come with strokes because they've taken pill for a long time and they've got deep vein thrombosis though indian women didn't have this more caucasian women but still we do find in indian women so sensitivity history taking selection of the patient is so important and the duration of what time more than 5 years i would not recommend the the morning after pill yeah um is meant to be an sos and not to be used regularly yes right? yes yes i've written to the companies also so many times because so many women are using the morning after pill as a form of contraception which should never be you see the morning after pill is the entire month of contraceptive tablets in one tablet hmm. so the entire month of contraceptive pill in one tablet that how does it work if you have not yet ovulated it prevents ovulation if you have ovulated it disrupts the lining of the uterus so that the uterus becomes hostile to a pen, uh, implantation and if you already implanted it it disrupts the implantation that's how it works and that it works like that because you are bombarding a large amount of hormones in one go so therefore i have had patients who have come with irregular periods and all sorts of problems because every time they've had intercourse they've popped a morning after pill and they've taken three four pills you should take maybe one pill maybe in one complete year and then you don't get your periods you uh, the polycystic ovarian syndrome is precipitated hormone imbalance is precipitated so many other side effects so therefore strictly morning after pill is when nothing else when you have there has been an accident condom has burst or you your regular form of contraception has not worked we do have and i, and I don't want to bring this up we do have um favorable abortion laws in india in comparison to the west but a lot of of women are still using the morning after pill as a form of abortion or using um uh, sort of yes because they don't find the medical system to be you know welcoming or or even perhaps uh, that's uh, unfortunate they, yeah. it should be more welcoming everyone should have access to their doctor and also the the mtp pills which are available now which are very effective but because of the P, pc pndt act that dictates who and very very rightly so who can give those they are not available over the counter the mtp pills i'm talking about where you can give up to the 8 or 9 weeks of pregnancy you have to go to a gynecologist the gynecologist should be actually certified to do mtp mm. and you have to have an ultrasound because to ensure that it's an intrauterine pregnancy and not an ectopic pregnancy in the tube and also that will tell you how many weeks pregnant you are otherwise these pills are very dangerous so all that then you go to the practitioner then the practitioner sees the the thing they and take your signature and then give you the tablets hmm. and then follow up and that's a very important way because otherwise everyone would be taking the tablets and they have a lot of side effects torrential bleeding you may could i have a syncope at home etc so unless it is given by a doctor it should not be prescribed at all it should not be taken over the counter they are not available but some unscrupulous chemists do sell you did say of course that things are not changing as fast as we would like them to change do you in your practice still encounter families who prefer boy babies over girl babies oh yes of here course. in mumbai in bandra here in mumbai in bandra in my uh, society now which is you know the upper you could say the higher and upper middle class society and even the very rich the richer you are the more you want a boy i tell you that much the, that has not changed it may be to a small extent but not changed at all everyone wants to have a boy i don't know i in certain communities they welcome girls because in certain communities it's a matriarchal system the girls look after the parents but in most the thing and i can say the majority if they have a girl they want to have a boy i have had patients who have had two girls three girls they've gone abroad because it's not available in india thank thankfully yeah. because female feticide was terrible all that is gone now they go abroad for gender determination they go abroad for um, to find out whether it's a girl or boy and then they come back and now it's very easy because of nipt that is a non invasive prenatal testing which can be done after 10 weeks of pregnancy where the mother's blood is taken out and then the fetal cells are filtered out from the mother's 
through a, a very good um, method. And then the fetal cells are then genetically tested. Mm. So the chromosome analysis is done and you can find out whether it's a girl or boy. So people go abroad for that. Mm. Uh, there are many centers where people do go for sex selection for IVF, sex selection for, oh, they're already pregnant. It's so sad. You know, over the years, I do not tell the sex of the patient, of the, of the baby till after the placenta comes out. Because if the girl is having a second, it's not that she, she would have loved to have, but the family. If she's had the second daughter or a third daughter, she may even hemorrhage to death with the shock of it. It's that bad. You know, and I'm so glad now that we don't have sonography to tell the sex of them. Because I, over the years, have seen daughters-in-law being treated badly because they are carrying a female fetus. My children used to tell me, because all all the patients give sweets, <laughs> uh, you know, when the baby is born. So the children used to say, ha, huh, this must be baby girl, this must be baby boy. Because for the baby girls, it would be ordinary pedas ordinary sweets but for a baby boy it would be kaju katli and we had kaju rolls and what not so the, my children would tell me this is a boy and this is a girl can you imagine to that extent and you've seen this happen not just in the pro bono work that you do but also in your fancy hospitals oh, everywhere everywhere it's universal I mean the other thing that I meant to ask you about um, and this is hard for all of us the case that we came across in Calcutta in Kolkata, where uh, this young doctor lost her life in such a terrible way. And um, we've seen a national reaction to it. And I remember you and I spoke immediately after. You have stories from your own residency. And yeah. all of the female doctors I spoke to were not surprised by this. No, you know what? When I was a resident, I'm talking about 40, 44, 45 years ago. In those days, I still remember I'd come from Bangalore, St. John's Medical College to Bandra Bhaba which was a municipal peripheral hospital. We used to stay in quarters where rats used to bite us at night. Drunken ward boys used to come with the call book because we had no cell phones at that time. All right. And we were exposed to, I was working in Rajawadi, Kurla, all these back of beyond places, traveling at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. I felt always safe. Even though all our resident doctors were all male, in Rajawadi, I was the only female in that entire quarters, but we were so safe. I never felt a moment of fear. When this, when my daughter did medicine over here and she was also in these hospitals, that's the time they were started getting little worried. And now the resident doctors are very worried. What has changed? What has changed is I think the respect for women has gone down. I don't know, thing, things have been different. You know, I, I, when I think, when I hear about this and I realize, I said, my God, we were exposed so often. And that poor, you know, that female, the nurse in, in KM, that was yes. much before my time. And that happened. And it can happen. And I, I look back and I say, thank God it didn't happen to me. Because I worked in Kamatipura in this, you know, in Naira Hospital as a lecturer, which is in the heart of, you know, Kamatipura and yes. Naira Hospital was there in the heart of the red light district. But we were so safe. And I used to travel all these years by car alone. I felt safe. I felt Bombay was safe. And just like that, Calcutta was also safe. Calcutta was another safe city. I wouldn't say the same for Delhi or any of those, but Calcutta and Bombay were similar in the form of safety in within the hospital norms. But I think corruption in Calcutta, and from what I hear, what meets the eye is not, what, what is actually projected is not really there because we know the people, it is all, you know, corrupt practices where, Seats have been sold. You can't get, unless you are um, promiscuous, you can't get a promotion. You can't, merit is no longer mm. considered. Mm. And that is what my young students tell me. Now, of course, I'm, I'm a teacher, but I'm a teacher in the private hospitals, not in the municipal hospitals or the government hospitals. I used to be a teacher in Nair for many years. And things were different there. Do you believe that there should be an overhaul of the admission system into medical sciences in India and the manner in which these hospitals are being run? manner in which these hospitals are being run is very, very important. There is no security anywhere. Absolutely no security. If of we, and you know, obstetrics, uh, women can die. If a person dies, everyone comes and thrashes the doctor. So many pediatricians have been thrashed, so many young, and these are young, our children. 
who are young resident doctors. They were the ones who faced the ire of these mobs. And people are so, you know, gone are the days when I started practice, the doctor was a god, you know. But no longer, you are questioned about every step that you take. So that doctor-patient relationship has deteriorated over the years. And I think a lot of it has to do because of the doctor themselves. But also, all these hospitals do not give security at all. They don't give poor patients. Do you know poor patients, in, especially I'll tell you in Maharashtra hospitals, I know because my daughter also went through and I also, poor patients who actually come from the slums, etc. There's no, the budget for these hospitals is abysmal. Gloves, catheters, things, IV fluids, they are giving chits and ask them to go and buy from outside. They, they cannot afford, how can they buy? They cannot afford private this thing. So we used to collect from the medical reps, etc., gloves, IV fluids and all that and give to the patients. But how long can you do that? But that's still the practice even now. You know, I still remember my my daughter taking money from me because she was in Rajawadi doing her, and, and saying, you know, this is for the poor patients. I have to buy gloves, I have to buy this and all that. And then the nurses used to tell her, don't act so smart and you buy, when you go, who will do it for them? Who, oh. you know? And that is the situation. It's not there in Chennai. I asked my resident doctor who, had, who was in Chennai. There, if you give a chit to any of the hospital patients, you will be, uh, you know, everything should be available in the hospital. They have a very good budget for their um, their government and their municipal hospitals there. You cannot ask the patient, poor patient, so free patient, to buy all the equipment which is not available. Whereas here, every patient is given the chit to buy. Why are so many Indian doctors going overseas to live and practice? Because better lifestyle? Better lifestyle. Better lifestyle, a good uh, dignity of labor, everything. You see, and now everything is stopped. People can't go to Australia. They can't go to USA. They can't go because they're the local people now have taken up. And there, there was a time where everyone, my own daughter went off to the US. She they, That year they didn't hold the entrance exam. There's no proper entrance exam. If you, you see what has happened with the NEET, the tragedy of the NEET patients, and people have suffered and everyone feels that why are we studying when someone is paying the money and getting the papers? It's so tragic for our youth. So anywhere outside where there is a fair system, they would like to go. What is your uh, advice to doctors, male and female, at the beginning of their careers? Oh, love your profession. Otherwise, leave it and go somewhere else. <laughs> because it's a long, 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 long haul. Mm. And unless you love it, because, you know, our profession is so demanding, Faye. You go to a, you know, maybe engineering or the finance world, or there are so many opportunities now for younger people. You don't have to do medicine. In the our days, it was either you did medicine or you did engineering, you know. But now there are so many opportunities. I still, still my niece, she runs, um, she is the owner, part owner of uh, Heads Up for Tales, oh. which is the biggest toy shop now, you know. Yeah. yeah. And she's doing so well, you know. So there are so many opportunities. So unless you really love humanity, because it's not all glory and the money is absolutely nothing compared to the rest. So unless you love your job and you love humanity and you love to do things for people, then you're not in the right place. Many second generation, I would say doctors, are those whose parents have nursing homes, whose parents are doctors. They have something to inherit. Mm. For them, it's okay because, you know, despite seeing their parents, they still want to do it. So that means they really want to do it. And then they have the entire setup for them. So then why not? So for them. But unless you love your work, it's very, very hard. And what's your advice to the women? Not necessarily doctors, but women in their careers right now trying to juggle it all, trying to have it all, uh, facing judgment for being working mothers. What would you say to them? I don't know what I would say to them because I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, yes, it's very hard because, you you know, abroad, if you see, men and women, they share the workload, but not in India as yet. We are still male-dominated. We still have to do the cooking or, you know, supervise the cooking, uh, see that the in-laws are fed, the husband is, gets his dabba, the children are fed, so that early morning, one or two hours goes on children. Then when you go to the workplace, 
there you're competing with men in a men, male dominating area could it it could be corporate it could be anywhere lo you be a lawyer be a doctor be it everywhere you are competing you so you have to be twice as good as everyone else so you're working long hours when you come home you have your mother in law saying oh she goes out she's had a good time and come then again you're back in <laughs> chores you know so lots of people are, and still i would say it's still nice to have a joint family because with a joint family the children are looked after with a nuclear family then you have you have to you know depend on maids etc i have to depend on maids for women i i would say you know be less ambitious be less ambitious be less and you have to be less ambitious i know i know i was ambitious and i achieved my goals but you know or maybe you know cut it don't do everything maybe select something you say it's not possible to have everything possible. it's not and it definitely is not possible there are so many times when i sit down and my children are far away they i feel i really fail them as a mother and that is a feeling that gnaws into your interior you know because your children are there for a short period of time if in that short period of time you've not given them your time you've not given them anything you know okay you you can say i was uh, you know you can say that you know they were watching a, a mother who was productive a father who was unproductive and you know they were doing good for others etc 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 they were not going for kitty parties and ignoring us they were actually working and then ignoring us but ignoring us is there <laughs> you know so i would say you know children are there for a short time they go off to college so those those 10 to 12 years pick up your career after that you know so now i can work long hours i have no one no no guilt at all because i'm not depriving someone of my company and i feel you know that relationship with your child um in their growing years is very important for you oh. sometimes i feel maybe my children would not have gone far away if i was closer to them those years and that's a real feeling which i which i have so that's why i say when you say advice to others for someone who's been there and done that of course now i'm enjoying the fruits of i would say of my hard work and all along i've enjoyed because i've been doing what i love to do but i think we have to compromise on that and women until the scenario changes unless until men step up to the plate and they say okay we'll do 50% of the work we still have to you know we can't have it all there's some do you see you're going to have a lacunae do you see as a result especially in your profession more and more women choosing not to have children at all yes men more and more women feel that this is our lifestyle if we have children it's going to ruin everything or ruin our um, my own family uh, my nieces etc none of them they have either they have double income no kids or they have double income one kid or they have double income and if you have three kids like you are the sperm king of the area <laughs> you know having three kids you know it's unheard of but since and you know everything is expensive having a kid is expensive so people actually and you have to have two incomes you can't afford a good lifestyle which you want to have uh, after all these years you want to have a good life so you can't have it with only one uh, person earning you have to have two people earning and then you have the kid that the each kid has got so much the right from your antenatal to the delivery charges to after that the little children the pediatric charges then everything that the child children are so demanding today and they have to study and you know the expense of each child is so much that people are, don't either they don't want to disrupt their life and they and when they actually want to have their kids when they are 40 and they realize they're going to be alone it's too late and that's where the increasing comes in and that's why surrogacy suddenly was such a roaring success in india because everyone had someone else to carry the baby but the surrogacy is something that we didn't touch upon and now as of 2023 we have surrogacy laws and no one can do surrogacy in india mm-hmm. and, and that's a long long route that you have to go you have you have various boards where you have to apply for the surrogate mothers the parents the who gives the baby should be related to you or not related at least you should know them and they should send affidavits the you the doctor has to say that this person couple can't have a baby they should ha- not have a, their own child you cannot have a second you cannot be single you cannot be uh, gay you cannot you be a foreigner <laughs> so there are so many you can't have in other words you can't have a surrogacy anymore 
But do you think that that prevents um, people who could have had children? Yes. And we've we've seen many examples of people who have children, uh, healthy children by a surrogacy. Absolutely. But I, are we closing that door as well? Is that fair? That's not fair. And we are fighting it tooth and nail because they have thrown the baby out of the bathwater, the government, mm -hmm. by banning surrogacy across the plate. People, I, a, a single mother, a single woman, many of them want to be single and they want to have a child. They want to experience their own child. Then why are you barring them? Who? Mm -hmm. The, you can have a surrogate sperm, but you can't have a surrogate egg now anymore. Oh. You know, so no egg donors. There are so many things. Uh, you know, a couple who has already had a, a child, and the only ex exception to the surrogacy is if you have a child who uh, con has congenital malformations, then you can. But still there is so much red tape. Still you cannot have a, uh, you know, now you have what we call altruistic um, surrogacy, yes. where you can't pay for the surrogate. And I feel, you know, there were so many surrogate mothers who were well paid and uh, they could run, you know, and look after their own children because their husbands were drunkards, their children sent their children to school. They were, it was a win-win situation. The problem was the intermediate couple, in the intermediates. Well, there were intermediates who would liaise with the doctors and liaise with the, with the, um, the, the mothers, the mothers. And they were the ones who actually were cheating the surrogates. And they were making money, the mid the middlemen. And it was because of that there were so many tragic stories that the government rightly so threw out this sort of surrogacy. But you should still have um, uh, surrogacy allowed to women who are not married, who are single, gay couples. I think you're, you're interfering with a person's right to have a baby, right to procreate by doing that. And you should not interfere with a person's personal, personal rights, is what I feel. So therefore, there should be changes in that and allow surrogacy again. Maybe have stricter laws, put people in jail, like the PCPNDT worked very well. Have something like the PCPND, put the doctor behind bars, you know, for 10 years and be strict about it. But, or put the person who's cheated the surrogate, but allow surrogacy. Oh. So, you're going to turn 70 soon? Yes. What happens now in your career? What are you looking forward you know, to? I still do three or four major surgeries every day. I work like I'm 50. I am physically uh, fine. I have the support of a wonderful husband. I hope to go on till I drop dead. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. You know, with uh, laparoscopic keyhole surgery, with robotic surgery, you can be very old and still operate. With robotic surgery, even the tremors are taken care of. You know, so and you can sit. So even if you can't walk, you get, you can sit. You don't have to stand long periods of time. Uh, you have the robo, and you have the, the the you have the knowledge of anatomy. You have the skill, and then why not use it for the benefit of humanity? So I think I will work till I drop. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Coelho, thank you so much for giving me time. It has been a complete pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much, Faye. As always, you are wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, congratulations, you made it to the end of the video. Thank you for watching. If you have suggestions for me on guests that I should bring on the show or subject matters you'd like for me to deal with, leave me a comment in the comment section. And of course, remember, like, share, subscribe and sign up for our membership program on YouTube. It will help us do a better job for you.